the human wave, you know, which moves along the stadium. Well, in the same way, this ripple came down the balcony towards us. And eventually I said to the man behind me, what's happened? And he said, Kennedy's being assassinated. That Friday afternoon, I'd finished teaching about four o'clock. And I thought between four and six, I'd take some of the cadets shooting on the range. So we went up with at least four, if not eight, cadets, and the captain is shooting, a young chap called Cameron Kennedy. And against all the rules, I asked him if he would lock up. So I gave him the armory keys, the magazine keys, and he had the weapons and the ammunition. And um, I left because the next day was Saturday, there was going to be a film, and so I thought, I'll, I'll thread up the first spool now. Suddenly, one of the auditorium doors opened, light flooded in, a smallish boy standing there in silhouette shouting, Sir, sir, Kennedy's been shot. Uh, with that, he, he disappeared and, and I switched off the light and I set off rather slowly. Could have been thinking about alibis, I suppose. Set off slowly for the, um, the sort of matron's area of the school and I didn't like to ask her directly, so I said, Matron, is there anything that I ought to know? And she said, yes. President Kennedy's been shot. <laughs> Whereupon the, uh, the weight was off me. I'd got my job back and I was extremely happy. This birthday party was being planned because it was my birthday. And, uh, and we were on the phone. Do we call the party off? People, no, no. And it, people really wanted to get together. That was the thing because everybody wanted to share this thing because they couldn't, nobody could handle it on their own. That was what was so strange. And again, I think this is something that nobody can appreciate now unless you were there. And, um, and so eventually the party happens and then we just danced and got drunk and fell about and cried and, and watched the television and it went on and on and on. And it was, it was almost like some, it was like you know, um, a Greek funeral. It was that almost pagan. I was in the bar of, uh, that Rediffusion Television used in Television House uh, in Kingsway. Uh, the telephone rang. It was a colleague who directed this week telling me that Kennedy had been shot and uh, he was coming in because we would want to do a program and nobody ever doubted that we should immediately uh, do a program. So we had to go around and try to get as many people as we could. We t tried everybody, most people were out of town. Anyway, we finally managed to get three Americans, Carl Foreman, the film producer, a man called John Crosby, and an actor called Eli Wallet. And we found that the BBC had grabbed Alec Douglas Hume and Harold Wilson, and uh, we had to make other arrangements, and we hauled George Brown, who was then deputy leader of the Labour Party, out of a party dinner. It was quite well into the evening by the time we got hold of him, and it was a bit later than that by the time he came into the studio at about half past ten. In the hospitality room, Bart Brown had obviously drunk too much. He was pretty drunk. When Wallach was introduced to Brown, Brown said, <clears throat> I'm a great admirer of yours. Oh, I said, thank you very much. And then he said, uh, yes, I've always... And he kept talking to Wallach. Wallach was interested in talking to him. He went over and took a drink. Brown kept shouting at me. And he said, uh, have you ever been in a play by Ted Willis? And Wallach said, no, who's Ted Willis? And Brown said, you don't know who Ted Willis is. Ted Willis was the author of Dixon and Doc Green, you see. You don't know who Ted Willis is, and, and Willis was a great labor supporter. No, I don't know. He said, that's the trouble with you actors. You're all so bloody conceited. I was in and out between the green room and the studio. Uh, I wasn't aware that there'd been any great uh, hoo-ha of any sort. Uh, the, I thought the atmosphere in the green room was a bit strange, but I put that down to the fact that people were grief-stricken. Walt listened to a time, and finally, he took his jacket off and he said, I'm going to knock the can off you. Get off that seat. Brown, without a surprise, sort of looked at him and said, oh, shut up, shut up. He said, come on, get up. So he leaped at him. I jumped in between the two of them to try and separate them. Here's the leader, deputy leader of the Labour Party and an actor tussling on the night Kennedy was shot. About ten minutes later, Brown got on the program was interviewed, the hysteria, the drink, and everything else, and he made a mess of the occasion. He was very much criticized, and his chances of becoming leader of the Labour Party were ended on that night. 
it was evening, late in the evening after the supper, and my father, he is sitting with his uh, papers which he brought from the office, and then it was next room, it was telephone call, and it was the foreign minister, Andrei Gramika, and he called it. It was some information which they received from the broadcasting that was something happened in Dallas with President Kennedy, or he wounded, or somebody tried to shoot him, or, or he killed, or something. And my father was very, very nervous, not only because it was the President Kennedy, but because if it is something happened in, in, in the other country, it can mean everything, including the war. And so he asked him to call to the ambassador and to find what's really happened, or it is true or not. And so he did not come back to his papers. He was in that room where was the telephone, it was small, round table in the middle, and he walked around there one minute, another minute, five minutes, it was no no call, and then he picked up the telephone. Until now it is the official confirmation from the White House that the president uh, died. Kennedy's press secretary was not at his side that day, but en route to Japan to organize a future presidential trip. We took off at 6 a.m. from Honolulu Airport for Tokyo. We were out about three hours when suddenly somebody grabbed me and took me into the lounge. Remember, this was a presidential plane. And there were sitting the six cabinet members, and suddenly I looked at their eyes. Something was really terrible. And they handed me a wire that had just come out saying, JFK has been shot. And they asked me to set up the telephone system to the White House. We had a very special system in that plane. The plane turned 180 degrees around, started back uh, towards Honolulu. I got through to the White House. It was total confusion. I couldn't really find out what was going on. And this went on and on and on until about a half hour later, suddenly I hear a shout in my ear, Wayside, stand by. Wayside was my code name. And then every 30 seconds for almost five minutes, Wayside, stand by, Wayside, stand by. And then Wayside, Lancer is dead. Lancer was the code name of JFK. I was crushed. I just, uh, I mean, for me, it was uh, the saddest moment of my life. Good evening. Well, as the whole world now knows, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 34th President of the United States, is dead. He was shot near At 11 o'clock, a Granada special for viewers in the North. It started off with, with Randy telling the audience all he could about what had happened, and he even was able to disclose the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald had been identified, and it wasn't known whether he had actually killed Kennedy, but certainly had been identified and was, and was subsequently arrested. When the press got to meet Oswald, the self-styled Liverpool Echo reporter John Peel was there. They brought Lee Harvey Oswald in, and I suppose he was about sort of five, six feet away from me. And, uh, either he didn't know what was going on, or he's a very good actor. I mean, he just looked kind of, come on, guys, you know, this has gone too far, you know. Is, is this a joke or what? And he had a big bruise on his cheek, I remember. And, I was, you know, he was standing, I was standing over there watching him, and Henry Wade said something like, you know, this is the man who's been charged with the assassination of President Kennedy, and of general excitement, and uh, then he was led away again. And, uh, as I say, I've told this story so many times that I didn't really believe it myself, but then I was round at Andy Kershaw's a, few, a couple of years ago, and he'd got one of those TV documentaries about it, and uh, they were showing this film of the whole proceeding. I mean, they'd put the film on uh, to demonstrate the fact that Jack Ruby was in the room as well, which I hadn't known until I'd seen this film. But in the last few frames, uh, there's me and my mate Bob standing there, just watching, you know. So it was true, and uh, I was rather startled, to be honest, to see the, the truth of it demonstrated. We, the newspapers of the world, of course, are full of the news. We have a little film now uh, of the newspapers, and then Mike Scott will be showing you those that have come into the studio. We've already got tomorrow's newspapers. Judging by this film, so have a lot of other people. Uh, they all have the same sad tale to tell. Daily Express. Kennedy is dead. Car ambushed. Finally, um, I, by that time, had all the details in the newspapers and, and read to camera the various headlines um, from, from the newspapers. And my, my last moment was... Strange in 